Um, now there's a song on your record called Song in My Mouth, yeah. and um, the words to it are a poem by E. Cummings. Yeah. Um, is, is he somebody you have been, um, you have read a lot of stuff of and uh, you like? Yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. do, where do you see uh, a connection between his poems and the music you, you create? Um, it's hard to say sometimes why you pick something up and why you're obsessed with it, but it's very important to follow it because usually two or three years later you figure out why and then it's too late because you're not in that emotional place anymore. So uh, I think it has got something to do with his faith in uh, quiet ecstasy mm -hmm. and, and sort of being very, very humble, but completely uh, enormous. I think it's a very rare, usually when people are that, about that sort of obsessed with climax, as most of his poems are, like so completely ecstatic and mm -hmm. euphoric, they usually go a little bit arrogant or pompous or like, 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 uh, but he never, he's always humble. So I guess in this album I was very focused on that to reach like a very, very grand sound, especially with the choirs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of song with big choirs, but to always, always, always be humble. And, and it's, it's usually these two things are opposite in life. Yeah. Um, but I, I was very interested, fascinated by this emotional state. You mentioned that uh, you are on, you're searching the perfect pop song, searching to write the perfect pop song, a song that people age three and age ninety can listen to and appreciate it. Um, are you still like uh, hunting for for that song? Hmm. Yeah, for sure. But but I'm very aware of it. it's a long way to go. You know, it's it's. Uh, uh, I always had these romantic ideas about uniting different worlds. And also I'm very interested in uniting abstract, because I think a lot, big chunk of our lives are, are pretty abstract, mm -hmm. if you like it or not, you know, the noises we hear and, 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 uh, and, and all these things. 
And, and then also, of course, the opposite, which is the, the narrative or, or uh, the, the, and obviously being coming from a country which is obsessed with uh, storytelling. I'm, I'm very obsessed with, with uh, uh, the narrative. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm still looking, but I have st uh, a long way to go. I think it was Damien Hurst from the BBC once asked, some, some reporter asked him, it was one of his things, uh, art pieces. Uh, he said, well, I could have done that. But then uh, Damien said, yes, but you didn't, yeah, <laughs> which, which I think was, is, is interesting to say that basically everybody could do it. Yeah, you agree? for sure. I think everybody could do it. And also for me, uh, maybe I'm not so concerned about if it's creative or not, because it's a funny word. Um, maybe because I'm brought up with such working class situation and uh, with uh, the people I admire most, like my grandmother and my grandparents and my family, uh, you, you, if you would look at their passport, no one of them says artist, you know. But for me, all of them have been very brave and, and completely stood by what they are made of. And sometimes just to take care of, um, you know, a lamp shop, it's very creative thing, or or to 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 feed the eight children can be a very pro-life statement with all the hindrances and and everybody wanting to stop you. So so uh, and my my grandfather he will show me a, a fireplace he has just made and Polaroid of it. Uh, just as proud as I will sh play him a song. So, um, yeah. It's all creative. It, it, for me, it is. You once said something about Vespertine in that, that some of the stuff was done in anticipation of, of the idea of Napster so that people could download it. What did you mean? Yeah. I guess Vespertine was partly done like that. Um, but uh, just those kind of chats I have with my mates who do music too, yeah. and they would complain about hearing the songs downloaded, and they would be like, "Ugh, you know, it's destroying my music," and and I guess just the prankster in me saying, "Listen, you know, um, folk music was always about taking your environment." and using it to do a tune. So um, our environment now is, is that. So it, it, those kind of limitations should be a turn on. You know, usually they are. The, the, the less freedom you have, it's sort of, you have to use more creative imagination. And it's, it's sort of a turn on. So, um, so, so um, I guess I used, the only acoustic instrument I used for the album were harps, celestes, and music boxes. But actually, once downloaded, they sound even better, you know. Mm. And the voice, just the mood of the internet, um, for me is very secretive. And every time I get an email, I felt like somebody told me a secret. And it's very. Um, Did you like that? I quite like that. Yeah. yeah. Me too. <laughs> and and that it's very. And my vocals are quite whispery yeah. because it's sort of secretive. And actually, that it's more like the, like you know, the virtual reality aspect of it. It is actually more how things happen. Our thought process, you know, mm. sort of there's no oxygen, and it just goes, you know, like more elec electric sort of things. So it's so um, so I I kind of wanted to. Um, make the album a little bit like that, that it's not kind of physical and blood on the outside, it's kind of more internal. I'm listening to Vespertine, it seemed to me that it was possibly your least immediate album, and yet it's become your fastest selling album, isn't it? How, how do you come to terms with that, or explain it? I don't know, I, I guess it's been this peculiar thing ever since um, I left the Sugar Cubes and I played my songs for uh, the record company. And he said, this is very strange. This will sell the third of the Sugar Cubes. And I said, well, 
that, fair enough, I still have to do it, you know. And, and uh, it seems the more um, idiosyncratic or selfish I get, the more people like it or something. Mm. I don't know, maybe there's not even a formula there. Right. But, um, but uh, I, I guess I just have my own mission and I have to follow it. And if people uh, are still curious and interested, that uh, makes me very happy, you know? But you said the Vespertine was really made, unless I misunderstood, that it was made for you to listen to at home, because it is an album about home and the inner self, and read a good book while you're listening to the album. But then I thought, I tried it, and yeah. it works really well. Yeah. But then doesn't Bjork become background music? Um, people like Eric Satie or Claude Debussy um, did music, and they aimed to do music that was called, in French, uh, furniture music, mm -hmm. but um, probably doesn't translate very well. The music de meuble. <laughs> I'm not oh. sure. <laughs> French is not my strong point. But it's sort of, they wanted the music to be um, like part of the part room, of the room that you're in, that you're not, it's not narrative. It's not like a person that's speaking to you. It's someone who's just there and makes you feel good, you know? And then maybe later in the century you had someone like Brian Eno, who did, then the music got the, probably a, a title that's more known, which is called Ambient mm -hmm. Music, mm -hmm. which is, and, and, um, and I, I guess it's, it's still a debate. Do you want music to be uh, very narrative and very, like, hello, listen to me with headphones, notice me? Or if you want it to be just kind of like around you, like a beautiful room that makes you do the things you want to do, you know? And uh, is, is the music the main role, or are you the main role? That's, that's sort of the question in a way. And I think, I think for me personally, uh, both have a right to exist. Um, it's obviously important for you to keep moving on, and some would say that horrible phrase about reinventing yourself every time. I don't think that, but what is it that drives you to move on? If you found a successful formula as a chef, you're going to sell the same recipe for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. When you're a musician and an artist like you are, what is it, that drive to bring something new, rather than more of the same? Hmm. I think it's just nature. It's, it's, uh, it's not in nature's nature to stay the same. For example, your hair, you know, you have to... Don't talk about my hair. You have to cut it. <laughs> no, it grows. It's, it's with normal people, they have hair and then it grows, and then it grows, and then they cut it or whatever. Yeah. But with people who are in my job, they have hair and then it grows and they've changed their image, you know. Yeah, yeah. And they reinvented themselves. Yeah, I <laughs> so I, I think everybody changes. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a feel good factor, I think. Probably more than courage. Is that, are those your decisions? What you wear and how you show yourself? Do you have people advising you and do you choose things? Or is it you or someone else? Well, I, I, uh, I decide what I wear. Yeah. But I'm, I, I have a lot of friends who are really um, uh, obsessed <laughs> <laughs> with clothes. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, I'm surrounded by good people. Your voice, right? For me, and I'm sure for lots of other people, it's the only voice that I've ever heard that can bring me to tears. Some of your, those things you reach, and to, not with words, with sounds. When do you discover? How young were you when that happened? I don't know. I guess as a child I sang a lot. You know, I, I was, my mom would take me to uh, bu the bus in the morning and I would actually be a Julie Andrews. I would, I would actually stand up and walk back and f down the bus and want to sing and make everybody happy. You know, and, and which is a bit sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. Yeah, so, so I think from very early on, I, I definitely, and, and, uh, and I've heard, I think a lot of singers, have that, you know, they, they kind of, um, like when I was in, I remember going on school trips and the other kids would ask me if it was a long drive back or something, they would ask me to sing. Ah! Uh -huh. 
and I guess um, with people who have similar job as I have, it it gets misunderstood, and 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 um, and uh, and kind of thinking maybe the media and and maybe maybe you go lazy because you've been doing it for so long that you say okay I've given this arm okay and then I give this arm and 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 so you kind of get confused and start giving things that maybe nobody wants or or the media will ask for things that is nobody's business and then you stop giving what you wanted to give in the first place but there is still if, if like before this album and I wanted to tidy it all up again and say okay let's look at it this very cl clearly that there is still a part of me that has hope and wants to give and communicate something that is quite private but it has nothing to do with my everyday life still it is still this bubble that this kind of fantasy fairy tale bubble I seem to be able uh, to uh, get better and better at what I do. For me, I uh, believe in emotion is above all. It's probably it's not a very modern thing. <laughs> no, I, I think a songwriting has to come, or music making has to come from emotional place. I guess for me, there's two kinds of politics. It's um, the sort of what usually it's called politics, which is sort of um, power struggles and um, uh, on a sort of um, international level. And th then uh, there's the other politics, which I think I deal with, which is about um, can you do you get along with the people you love and, and, and uh, those kind of relationships or, or those kind of personal politics. Mm. I think it's very important in times of, of, of war is to not forget the, the personal politics, if you want. That, um, and, and I think music um, is about that. I don't think the way to deal with uh, the September 11th is to sit down and write a song about it. I think you have to sit down and write a song about something else because there are more things in the world than Bush and Bin Laden. I guess in my case is when you uh, can create, when you're in a position where you can create either music or um, communicate with the people you love, mm. uh, and it's so strong um, that it's the same on the outside as it is on the inside or same passion is maybe a better word mm -hmm. and then it's sort of as even like it's it's the flow is kind of um, even and I then I feel very very happy so needy of comfort but too raw to be
people are free to to think what they want. Um, I think the nature of most musicians is generosity. You really want to give, and and you actually, when you're three or four, you actually stand up on a table in the kitchen and you want to sing a song that will make all the upset people in the kitchen happy. And even though you become a grown-up, that's still what lies behind it all. I think after all the interviews I did and all the paparazzi and the media attention and and this kind of feeling of being robbed, um, I had to act and not and starting thinking the solution was not to give anything mm. away, and then sitting down and think, wait a minute, that's not right, and 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 try to f figure out why you started doing it in the first place, you know, and and I think uh, people with my job they sincerely want to give, but they of course like in any human. Um, um, relationships, they want to choose what they give and what they don't give, you know. And you, you can, I can promise you that there are 900 things that, that I didn't say <laughs> that <laughs> I would sure like to prefer to, to keep to myself. Yeah. People often say, don't they, that your music's avant-garde or weird, which uh, doesn't seem right, but on the other hand, it's not easily categorized pop music, is it? But I always think it's more like the second generation of pop music, what you're doing, and bands like Radiohead as well, you're sort of taking this whole medium forward. Are you conscious of wanting to take the medium forward? Is, is being at the cutting edge and pushing that boundary forward something that you really want to do? Uh, I want to make music that I want to, that I would like to walk now to Tower Records and buy a CD that would like save my life. I, I've done that so many times and I've walked Done, so many times I walked out really disappointed, mm. and and uh, it's a lot of times I walked out like in heaven, you know. So I think that's what I, I aim for. Um, um, I think if you aim for being cutting edge, it's just going to be empty. It's not going to be. It's just going to be too clever or something. Mm. I like uh, to move forward for sure. I, I think, but I don't think of it maybe as moving forward. I think it's more about being truthful. In uh, did a, uh, a gig in London, but you chose the Royal Opera House. Was that a conscious move to move away from pop venues, or was it just a fantasy that you wanted to be on stage in Covent Garden? Well, it just started off being purely musical decision to go for the acoustics, uh, because having a lot of harps and a choir and, and uh, orchestra and electronic noises, like the world that's on Vespertine, you can't play that in town and country club, you know, it would just be like drowned in lager and screams, you know. And um, so uh, I started look, looking for places like theatres and churches, chapels, galleries, just anything that, that, um, that was built for acoustic music. Mm. And operas, that's what they are built for, you know. But believe me, I, I, uh, that was not my, my target. Thinking, oh, all of a sudden I'm a classical musician. I, I mean, the music I make, the heart of it, is folk music or pop music. I, I don't think it's um, um, classical music yeah. or, yeah. I mean, I, I was very honored about the comments people made about that. But um, I, I think at the, at the heart, I'm a pop musician. And I have education. I could have gone pretty serious composer style but I had I had that choice and but I didn't choose that because it's not what uh, uh, what my mission is you actually performed uh, the songs from Vespertine for the first time here in New York in this very church was it really kind of scary to be performing really such personal music in kind of a holy place it, it was actually um, as much I've been playing live since I was a teenager. This was kind of the most um, feeble situation because it just didn't know where to start. Yeah. And first we played songs in our rehearsal room and invited, I think, five friends over. Mm -hmm. And then we played them again in the rehearsal room and invited 40 people over, friends so you and... So build up to a comfort level. Yeah. <laughs> and then we played here. I saw an interview of Björk, then I realized that she's trying to express 
express her music, and we help her expressing the music that she wants to give. We like an instrument. This is the first time we ever worked together as a choir. Björk put it us together. And some of the girls haven't even been on choirs before. But everybody has uh, some kind of, you know, they have been singing. Some of them are recorded art, recording artists. Yeah, but they're most solo singers. Yeah. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. I think the last puzzle for the tour was um, the choir. I, I knew I wanted some vocals, um, and, and I had uh, ended up recording with an English choir that was very neutral, and they would sing all these things we asked them to sing, and then we would chop them to pieces and kind of use bits and change them and put effects on it, and all sorts of things, so we used them more as a uh, material. Um, then, just before the tour, uh, I decided to go on a three-week holiday and, um, and went just to the place I wanted to go myself and, uh, and uh, went to Greenland and realized after like uh, three days that, you know, of course, you know, I, it should be a Greenlandic choir. And, and, uh, and uh, so I started, I put uh, advertisements in the supermarkets that were there and uh, would put a little announcement on the radio and, um, and then I would start auditioning in, in a hotel I was staying at and, um, and, and ask them to sing, each girl had to sing one song. Some of them would sing um, uh, Greenlandic folk songs, Inuit, which I was, of course, very pleased with. Other ones would um, um, probably try to impress me with um, me being a European pop star and uh, bleach their hair and sing ABBA songs, um, which was very, very interesting but maybe not what I was looking for.
थैंक यू Yeah, the first tour I did, um, the debut, I I did auditions and hired session people, and everybody did what they were told. So we rehearsed very well, and the first show was like that, and the, all the other shows were like that. So it was very uh, nailed down, and I, I made a promise through that tour that I would never do that again. So slowly, I moved towards. Um, where I was halfway there with post tour and completely there with 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 homogenic that that I, I i gave people half things they could do and the other half had was space for them to grow and license to to change things because it, most of all if if i have told everybody what to do and how to do it i walk on stage and i'm bored stiff you know, I'm like it's death. So for me to walk on stage and somebody, I will sing something and then somebody will play something that I'd, I'd never thought of. It's like excellent, you know. And that's what why you look forward to the next show, you know. Um, obviously, on West Berlin tour, you couldn't go that far because you had an orchestra and you had a choir, so you can't be that spontaneous, you know. Um, what was excellent about Zena and Matmos is they are very good at that. They could be completely keep in line with the orchestra and the choir, but still kind of, kind of really. And, and I could hear with Matmos like every show they had gone somewhere and found new sounds and new things and and and, and just to be completely selfish, that was what kept me excited. You know, the, and with Zina and Matt was those kind of oh, spontaneous squirts. You know, there is this world. It's the harp world of you know harpists, and and I'm not. I'm always. I've always been quite apart from that. You know, because I didn't really study formally. Um, it's. I studied mostly on my own, so I was never really apart. You know, I didn't have a lot of friends that were harpists or anything like that. So. I don't think it's that normal to be that aggressive with, with the instrument. I know there's, there are a few people here and there that do more radical things, but for me, I, I think it's a very beautiful melody instrument, but I also think it's an incredible percussive kind of instrument as well. Just this like kind of fantastic sound maker and not just a beautiful melody machine. So I love to approach it with, with putting both things into it.
when we started uh, arranging live, we realized um, that we couldn't just put big uh, PA or speakers on stage and blast those uh, micro beats over and make them large to send them to the other end of the room because it would change their character completely. It, they would become large again. So, uh, so what we had to do was we had to put um, speakers in the back um, and, uh, and um, make the, all the little beats uh, travel around. So all of them would be quite quiet, but the, um, uh, the, the audience would feel surrounded by many, many tiny things. I, I've had this craving to do this for so long. Um, and I felt so many times when I did those big rock arenas that, that uh, I mean, I'm probably exaggerating this, but that uh, 60, 70% of what we were giving out was just lost in some sort of a rock cliche or something. Like all the sensitivities were bulldozed over and and um, since I'm I'm a sort of listener that these are exactly the sensitivities that nurture me or make me walk home from a gig and I'm fulfilled you know mm -hmm. so I had this craving to do this for a very very long time so when I would step on the stage of the most intimate places and feel like everybody I was singing personally for everybody in the room it of course was quite scary and you can't hide anything you know but also it was a craving i had for such a long time that, you, that it, it sort of felt like a relief sort of like a uh, you know so i guess it was a combination of both but but i do like it um, you know the whole chocolate thing to be able to do it really, really, really well with all the lushness possible. And, and, but also combined with the fact you've never done it, so it's very scary. And the sort of entering the unknown sort of adrenaline kick is, is, is uh, it's a turn on, you know, instead of just doing one more uh, what you did last time. And also I started craving it myself to go to a concert where I have a comfortable seat and, and I can enjoy all the little details and nobody is in a hurry. You just sit there with your box of chocolates and, and then you can go and have a break and talk a little bit and then you come back and, and the pace is very slow, you know. And for me, I, I don't know if it was a local joke between me and myself and maybe no one got the joke, but for me, it was the biggest challenge, in the, especially in the beginning of the tour, to just do a calm song and, and do another calm song and, and then do another calm song and, and another calm song and then have a break. And, and to, to not, it's so, like, pro, I'm so programmed to just have a multiple orgasm on stage, like in three seconds, and, and to kind of have to, uh, put all my energy into pacing myself for two, three hours and never peak or, 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 or explode, just kind of was, was very curious, you know. I just hoped, hope other people enjoyed it too. <laughs> I love him, 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 I love him. She loves him, she loves him, it's time, I'm gonna keep it to myself. She loves him, she loves him, it's time. I'm gonna keep him out to myself But it makes me want to hurt myself I
Every tour has been completely different. There's been tour that's been completely crazy, where everybody has had a nervous breakdown and and, pe and everybody has fallen in love with everybody and, and split up and fallen in love again with other people. And it's been a complete soap opera. There's been other tours where, where um, everything was completely utopian and, 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 and very, very, happy and everybody having out-of-body experiences and everybody coming out of the closets one way or another. I mean, touring is great. It can have a very strong effect on people, that especially when they've been living in the same place for a long, long time and suddenly they tour the world and it sort of becomes like a very um, explosive thing for their lives. They have to kind of they see the rest of their life from another point of view and they have to like tidy up and they get into this kind of state of kind of urgency and, and kind of, and, and it can be a real, real excitement. Um, I think Vespertine tour for me compared to the other ones was a very peaceful one. It was a very calm one and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe without realizing it, I chose because of the music, those kind of people that were very self-sufficient, very, um, 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 happy. There, there, there was no conflict on this tour. Well, I think I already put on the album everything I wanted to put. And I was very, very careful. I, I would be um, very in connection with the people that I wrote about. I, I truly believe that. I was very happy with, with how the concert happened. Like always um, in the beginning, like when I beginning of the post tour, when I told, okay, uh, I'm going to have a pipe organ and accordion and uh, live mixing and voice on stage. And everybody would go, but you have like hundreds of thousands of people to play for it. Well, how are you going to keep a crowd with an accordion and a pipe organ it's, it's, and, and, and a live mixer and a voice? Um, and and the things you just push it and push it and push it and it works. And then homogenic, I'm going to take a string octet and one beats to the venues. And everybody's like, I mean, you're crazy, you know, you, you, it's a suicide, you know. And it and so it's always sort of exciting. And I, I have to admit, I'm a bit of a junkie that I want to do things that are Sometimes I even fall into the trap to do them just because they're impossible or something. I have to say, but but with with uh, with Vespertine, I think there were definitely moments. And now that we mixed the Vespertine live album, that were better than the record. I think um, looking back on Vespertine now and having started my uh, next project, it becomes more obvious uh, what I was aiming for. Sometimes when you're in the middle, you don't see out. Um, I think I was aiming for how you can express yourself when you are absolutely, um, you exploded 5,000 times and there's nothing left. And you're just lying there, like the ruins of you, but you still want to make something, but you have no, muscle and you have no blood and, and, and you still want to create beauty and uh, that's supposed to kind of calm you and soothe you and, and, and uh, like hibernation to wait until to help you to wait until you become strong again. So I feel to a certain degree I've documented I mapped out all the sides of me and Vespertine being the last side of me and it, probably the one I, I, I have least in me. Um, so doing homogenic, which is probably sort of more, uh, what is uh, more extrovert, kind of more physical outdoor me. And then knowing I wanted to also cover the other area of me which, um, which is sort of more uncomfortable, like the moods, 
you have when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep and you're on your own and and when you feel alienated or 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 um, so more these kind of transparent moods but i i think uh, like with everything i've done especially when i i have uh, freedom to be very extreme in something like say with vespertine to go all the way in that direction it sort of means i get it out of my system and then i'm ready to uh, to uh, turn to other things i feel now very very uh, liberated that uh, i've done vespertine and uh, i've done uh, homogenic uh, and i've sort of covered all the different areas that were always fighting inside of me there were conflicts between <coughs> my classical education and i mean the easiest way was just to ignore it but then taking it on and dealing with it and and uh, conflicts with me as a vocalist as a songwriter as a collaborator as somebody who wanted to work alone it was like a lot of conflicts there and to have sort of mapped and tried everything of the biggest things in, inside me once it's done it's documented and now i have a clean slate and and as much as uh, it's scary it's also very very exciting to um to have uh, they, i could do absolutely anything right now which is very introvert it's sort of about losing yourself with no ego at all 
so when you ask for people to join in, you sort of ask masses of people. So it's not like an individual, say like, that has got no personality. It's, it's, it's about the masses. You've got an orchestra of 50 people that uh, you, they lose their ego in the masses. So I think when you are writing music on your own at night and you want to make a very in introspective album, the few moments when somebody joins in, in your head, in your imagination, it's masses. It's not individual characters, but it's like masses. So it is very controversial. I completely agree with you that you do the most introvert, private performance you've ever done in your life, and it happens to be 74 people on stage with you. <laughs> but it sort of makes sense if, if you look at it that way.